So in recent years, a ton of companies have been working on self-driving car technology, from Tesla to Uber to incumbents like Ford and GM. But it seems like Waymo, the Alphabet subsidiary, have kind of taken the lead. So they've done a couple of things that have been really interesting. The first is that they've been testing their cars in Detroit to give them winter weather experience so they don't just work in, you know, the sun of California. The other thing Waymo have been doing is in Chandler, which is a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, where they've been rolling out this driverless minivan program where people will actually be able to call a driverless minivan, like as you would an Uber, and get sort of this autonomous driving experience. I think Waymo's progress has to be really threatening to competitors, um, because I think a lot of people saw self-driving cars as being this commoditized technology that would be developed by a bunch of people at about the same time, or just become embedded in a ton of different vehicles. But it seems like Waymo is so far ahead, but it could be really kind of their level of expertise, um, which will give them a substantial advantage from competition. Yeah, there has been amazing strides so far, but I'll point out that on its debut voyage in Las Vegas, a self-driverless shuttle was actually hit by a simming truck. And in this example, the truck backed in to the self-driving uh, shuttle at low speeds, and the car just sat there and allowed itself to be hit. And so this is pretty typical of self-driving wrecks we've seen so far, where the car just simply has these low-speed fender benders, and it does something that you wouldn't expect a human to do. Um, for, for example, they stop at a stoplight too long, or they pause at a ride on red. People don't do this, and because of this, it's causing wrecks. And I think because of that, we're going to have to wait and see if this technology can develop to replicate human behavior a little bit better. Yeah, there's a ton of like little day-to-day -day interactions where a driver is maybe talking to a pedestrian, like waving them across the crosswalk, or communicating in some fashion. And self-driving cars don't really right now have the means to kind of have those communications. Um, and while these things might seem kind of trivial, there are kind of like more serious examples. Um, in philosophy, they talk a lot about the trolley problem, where maybe you have one person on a train track and two people on another train track, so you kind of have to decide like how you're going to flip the switch to, um, to save two to, to kill one. Um, and for self-driving cars, the equivalent is what if you have passengers in the car versus pedestrians on the road, and a self-driving car uh, maybe only is notified of pedestrians very late, and it has a very short time to make this decision, and it can, be, it can either hit the pedestrians or it can swerve off the road. Um, and in this case, you actually find that a self-driving car needs a set kind of ethical framework um, mm -hmm. to determine how to make these decisions. And so there was this really interesting paper by Carnegie Mellon and, and MIT authors but polled a bunch of humans, basically gave them a survey on ethical scenarios for a self-driving car. So it would say something like, what if there's a, a female doctor crossing the road and there's two elderly passengers in a self-driving car and you could only save one or the other? Like, what would you do? What's the more ethical decision to make? And so based on aggregating kind of the human survey answers, um, the authors of a paper say that you can kind of encode this framework into a self-driving car to have it make correct ethical decisions. Now, I'm not really sure this is the best way of doing things. I mean, what if the, the survey respondents are biased in some way? Um, you could get some really problematic results there. But I'm glad at least of the authors at least thinking about, you know, these scenarios are going to come up and how are we going to be able to deal with them. Well, the irony of self-driving cars is that they've become more ubiquitous. You can start to take advantage of them. So today, if I want to be a really aggressive driver, blow my horn, go through red lights, I'm probably going to get hit. But in this world of self-driving cars, the reality is these things are going to stop for me. Um, and if anything, I do get hit, I'll just get to sue some large multinational corporation, no big deal. The other thing you can think about, and I know you're going to say I have a negative view of society, is that today, carjackings are pretty rare. Mm -hmm. But in the future, if I can rely on my self-driving car to stop for me, then what will happen is people will walk in front of your car, rob you, and the car will take off and go about its day. And this is something that people are not going to enjoy. And I think it calls into a larger point, which is the strength of self-driving cars comes when they're ubiquitous and we've solved these problems. Well, you know, perhaps you'll be able to pay for some kind of anti-carjack emergency mode for your self-driving car. Um, but overall, I agree with you that this is only going to work really when it reaches close to 100% market saturation. And for that, you're probably going to need some kind of government legislation to kind of help self-driving cars along. Um, if you look in the US, I don't think it's likely to happen here. Um, states really control driving, and I don't think many states are going to be willing to tell their residents, you can't drive your non-self-driving cars anymore. Even states like California that are kind of willing to push the boundaries in terms of emissions regulation, that kind of thing, are likely going to look at things like tourism and say it's not going to be great for us if we can't let people drive into our state. Um, so looking to where this is more likely to happen, I would say European governments um, would be the ones who would say, okay, let's legislate out non-self-driving cars, make it self-driving only, maybe a city or a metro area of some kind. But even here, they're going to run into different externalities associated with cars. Um, so this is stuff like, what's the effect on public transportation? You know, if you have a self-driving car that you can just call and it'll take you anywhere and you can read a book on it, like why would you ever ride a bus or ride a train? It just doesn't make any sense. 
Um, and so I think European governments are going to be worried about things like the environmental impact of these cars and the impact on congestion. And so even there, they might not really want to promote self-driving cars too much. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point when we think about the commoditization of this technology. Uh, anybody that's ever ridden on a bus or train knows they're pretty gross. <laughs> You're giving up some convenience of travel for maybe not a great experience, and I think these cars will be much the same. Now, of course, there'll be some luxury high-end options, but the big question I think these manufacturers need to ask is, how do you handle suburbia? How do you handle the mom with three kids who you know, effectively has a car that's a rolling closet? You can't replace that with these commoditized sort of rent-on-demand cars. And I don't see an immediate solution for this problem. So to me, this is a big challenge. When I look at somebody like Waymo, their technology has come along very fast, but I really only see inroads in places like San Francisco or New York where this makes sense for the given demographic you have available. So for me, I'm very much hoping that my non-self-driving manual car retains its value for as long as possible. Uh, this has been Random Talkers. Thank you for joining us.